Good evening, everyone. So, uh, Monica, thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate you taking uh, time to uh, share your thoughts on this very important topic. Um, so, uh, for everyone who's joined uh, us, you know, a quick uh, introduction. Founders Talk uh, is a webinar series that happens every Wednesday and Saturday, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., where we invite uh, entrepreneurs, investors, business leaders, educators, uh, and, and, and the discussion is all things entrepreneurship and innovation. So uh, we have a very interesting topic today. Uh, before I delve a little bit on the topic and the speaker, uh, just a couple of uh, announcements. Um, we've been experiencing a lot of rains here in Pune. Uh, so it, just in case we have power cuts or uh, internet fluctuations, don't worry, we should be back in a minute or two. Uh, uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, the Founders Talk webinar series is uh, brought to you by Flame Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation where we run various initiatives. We have a startup accelerator program, uh, which is equity free uh, and uh, with no tuition fees associated with it. It's a five month program. It's called the Flame Origins program. 19 startups have gone through this accelerator program over the last couple of years so far. Uh, the applications are open. We have an uh, incubator program for students as well. Uh, so any Flame uh, alumni or current students who have joined us, um, you know, the applications are open for the incubator program as well. And lastly, we've launched a one year postgraduate program in entrepreneurship and innovation, where uh, we have uh, very good partners uh, such as uh, uh, Vadwani Foundation, uh, we have uh, Thai Pune, uh, we've just signed on Your Story Academy as our partner. Uh, to run this program. And of course, we are part of the larger ecosystem with Babson College and Babson Collaborative. So uh, the applications are open and we are closing applications on 15th of August. So anyone who might be interested now is probably a good time to reach out and um, apply. Now that I'm done with my announcements, <laughs> let's get into the topic. Um, you know, the the pandemic uh, COVID-19 crisis has hit uh, India hard. Uh, a lot of the MSMEs, a lot of the well-funded startups um, have, uh, have experienced a lot of challenges. Many of them are looking at closing or shutting down. Many have left, let go of employees, including some of the largest companies. Uh, overall, business uh, economy, uh, business scenario is, is at an all-time low. Right, but uh, as we have seen in the previous Founders Talk series, um, a lot of new uh, startups, new innovations have come out through crisis. A lot of large companies, including the likes of Disney, GE, Salesforce, Slack, uh, so many of them, uh, including uh, Flipkart, are uh, an outcome of crisis. Right, uh, so. Today, what we want to do is we want to take this further and um, I'm extremely grateful to Monica Mehta to, to join us and share her thoughts. She comes with a rich uh, experience. I'm just going to quickly uh, walk you through um, an introduction about Monica. She leads the Vadwani Entrepreneur Initiative of the Vadwani Foundation, which focuses on the college program. Uh, just for those who don't know what Vadwani Foundation is, uh, it's a philanthropic organization which is focusing towards job creation through entrepreneurship uh, with its presence across the globe. Um, prior to joining Vadwani Foundation, uh, Monica was a director at Omidyar Network, where she led the education and skilling investments as well as grants in India. She has also been the founding partner at Kaizen Private Equity, which is India's only private equity fund focused on education. Her experience has spanned across strategy, investments, and operations over the past 28 years. She enjoys solving complex problems, especially in early stage businesses where the obvious solutions are lacking. Uh, overall, you know, today, uh, suddenly education and ed tech has become uh, a big center focus, right? A lot of investments have gone through. But uh, Monica has been doing this and working towards supporting education or ed tech entrepreneurs for a very, very long time. 
So who's better positioned to share with us, uh, you know, what kind of opportunities lie, not just in education sectors or skilling sectors, but otherwise. So over to you, Monica, again, thanks a lot. For all of you who are attending, uh, we have a Q&A box. Feel free to uh, add in your questions. I'll pull them up and bring it to Monica. Uh, we want to make this an interactive uh, session. So please feel free to as, ask as many questions as you'd like. Thanks a lot. Over to you, Monica. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Darshan, for that introduction. Um, EdTech is a passion for me, so I'm really excited uh, about uh, what's going on around me, right? I mean, all of the things we've imagined about EdTech are finally uh, beginning to uh, bear fruit, so, so that's, that's exciting. Uh, but thank you for having me here, and uh, hello to everyone that's here um, on our session uh, for, you know, Next Gen Ideas um, on, uh, you know, on startups. And uh, I, I just like to kind of, you know, um, tell you a little bit about uh, what Radwani Foundation is just in a few lines before I actually head into the topic and maybe right at the end I'll tell you more about our programs. So um, you know very quickly before I start I just always love to know who my audience is. So uh, could somebody at Flame kind of do a quick poll and can we kind of know how many people in the audience are entrepreneurs or you know, founders, professionals, educators, I'm sure you all can see this uh, on your screen. So um, can you all please vote guys quickly and I'd, I'd love to have a quick um, understanding and insight on this. Oh, nice. So, um, so predominant percentage of our audience is either a current founder or an aspiring uh, entrepreneur, which is, uh, or, or even a part of the startup ecosystem in some way. Um, and so, so, so that's great. I, I will just kind of move my conversation in that direction in that case. And, you know, I'm going to keep my presentation short, guys. Uh, I just want to share my experiences and my thoughts, but uh, I always love for my conversations to be interactive. So I'd love to hear from all of you and, and feel free to, you know, um, and pass on your questions to the Flame team and, and I'm happy to answer those as we go along. Um, so very quickly, a little bit about Badwani Foundation, who we are and what we do. Um, and um, Badwani Foundation is set up by our founder, Ramesh Badwani. He's based in the Bay Area, a successful serial tech entrepreneur uh, who, uh, who experienced great success as an entrepreneur and decided to give back. So our foundation, the Badwani Foundation, has an endowment of $1.5 billion that Ramesh has put in and with a single-minded mission uh, to create high-value jobs at scale. And when we say high-value jobs, we think of jobs that can support a family of four. Uh, and towards that end and towards that mission, we have several initiatives at Badwani Foundation that actually work towards that end goal. One of them is the one that I lead along with my team, uh, and that's Wadwani NEN. NEN stands for the National Entrepreneurship Network. And incidentally, this has been our flagship program at Wadwani Foundation. So we started with this 15 years ago, and we continue to run it today. Of course, it's changed this avatar several times. And so what we are currently doing is uh, a couple of uh, programs in entrepreneurship across various colleges. And I'll talk more about that at the end. But our real intention of running these entrepreneurship programs is to support young students uh, and aspiring professionals to actually enter uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship and, and go along that journey. And we want to really handhold them, not only through the program, but through a lot of mentoring, handholding and support to ensure that they are, you know, that they survive and sustain along this journey. Uh, and again, um, you know, tying this with the end goal of our foundation is that we hope that if they survive and sustain, they will eventually grow and create jobs. And therefore, you know, we will fulfill our mission of, of job creation. Uh, everything that we do is non-for-profit and therefore not charged for. Um, and our, our intention is just to uh, hopefully help 
a bunch of livelihoods along the way. Um, so having said that, I'm going to move ahead. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so, you know, a little bit about our programs and then, you know, I will actually move to, to you know, what we're really going to talk about today. So we have a methodology that's unique. Uh, you know, it's a watch, think, do, learn kind of, you know, methodology. So we have a lot of video-based learning. Largely, these are flipped classroom models where the you know, students or professionals watch these videos at home. And then, you know, we have a practice venture that is launched from the very first day of the course. So that, you know, we go along that journey with the student. Um, and as the course, you know, progresses, so does the practice venture, right? And at the end of it, you have a real practice venture that, that comes out of it. Uh, and we have the foundation program and, uh, you know, an advanced program. So in the foundation program, you come up with a, uh, you know, a potential real venture at the end of it. But when you come out of the advanced program, you come out with an absolute real venture. So maybe the foundation program leads you to a minimum viable product, but your advanced program leads you to a real venture, which has customers and revenues, etc. cetera, right? Um, this is a little bit about, you know, the program and how it runs. So like I already mentioned to you, we have two programs, uh, but our target segment, like I said, is aspiring students. We also have, you know, existing student entrepreneurs who might be at an idea stage or a business model stage that might want to come into our programs. So therefore, we have, you know, uh, colleges that we tie up with, but we also have students who can come in as lateral entry students who may not be in a college where we may be running our programs, right? And our delivery models are threefold. One is the direct faculty model where we tie up with colleges and their faculty are trained by us. And through our LMS and through the programs and curriculum that we have, uh, online, um, the faculty that we have trained teachers at their college, uh, batches of you know, students that want to go through our entrepreneurship program. Uh, the director classroom model is where our own faculty sitting back in our studios and now, of course, in the comfort of their home given COVID. And they, they teach the same, uh, the same courses to um, students, um, no matter where they are. I mean, you know, they could be dispersed. Um, earlier, they were in classrooms and colleges, but today we call it direct to home, actually, because most students are at home and, you know, we are teaching students live at home. The direct to student model is actually a, a completely digital model, which we're actually launching on the 7th of September. So we're very excited about it. It was COVID that led us to believe that while the direct to classroom model was working in a sense, we hadn't developed it for digital consumption. So we kind of have, you know, innovated and changed a lot of our material to ensure that we can now uh, digitally deliver uh, our entrepreneurship programs. And like I mentioned, uh, you know, we do have uh, an orientation and a diagnostic tool because I feel we must filter out students that are really you know, apt for entrepreneurship because it's a journey that's not for everyone. Uh, but we also do have, um, you know, uh, lateral entries if you're not in a particular college and a practice venture is something that you go through um, irrespective. Uh, at the end, uh, you know, uh, and I'm not sure if you can um, see this, but uh, right at the end, we have the WF, which is the Vadwani Foundation platform. So we have an app which has on-demand content and connect, so you can connect with mentors. And we kind of want to handhold students even beyond our courses. And hopefully that leads to high performing organizations for us. Uh, moving on, uh, like this is just a graph that shows you all our programs that I talked about it. So I'm not going to dwell on it much more. But on the left side, you can see the foundation and the advanced courses that I talked about in the director faculty and director classroom mode. Uh, and, you know, uh, very often these are, you know, early college and late college students. But when we thought of the D2S, which is your right side, uh, and we have two programs that are starting on September 7th. One is Activate and the other one's Ignite. Uh, so Activate, really, we're actually going down the value chain. And, you know, we're actually targeting even high school students because we feel that uh, in the day and age that we live in, even young st school students are very, very excited about, you know, going down the entrepreneurial journey. So we're going to have um, a course that is a little more easy to understand and a little more suited for school students. And Ignite, again, is for you know, college students who are already either budding entrepreneurs or are aspiring to be entrepreneurs. But that's completely for digital consumption. So that's how um, we go with that. Um, on the 360 support, which is an absolutely integral part of our program outside of the classroom work that you will do if you're in a college, or even if it's digital D2S, if you're doing it online, we have something called the 360 degree support, which is if not uh, more important, at least as important as, as, as our core curriculum. 
So what we really do is we ensure that, you know, we have mentor support for, for you. Um, and that is ongoing throughout the program. Uh, we ensure that we give you real time feedback uh, through these open pitch days that we have. So you can come and pitch your, you know, pitch your uh, startups to us. Uh, we also have demo days where, you know, you actually present your startup to a, a jury of experts and then they, you know, have a chance to give you some feedback and, you know, give you uh, maybe thoughts on where you can improve, where the gaps might be in your startup or in your thought process. Uh, we also have open hours where WF faculty are present and, and you can actually come and provide, uh, you know, your thoughts to them and they can provide real time feedback to you. Uh, and then we have master classes, you know, it could be Ash Moria coming up with the lean canvas or someone from Oyo Rooms or some from, from Shadi.com. I mean, you know, good quality entrepreneurs that have been successful, but you know, we want you to learn from our successes as much as from our failures as entrepreneurs. So we have all sorts of, uh, you know, panelists and masterclass um, uh, marquee, uh, you know, experts coming to speak. Uh, and then the open house where we really, it's, it's a webinar where we again call some industry experts and entrepreneurs to talk to you about real world scenarios and, and you know, you can have a Q&A with these industry experts. So what happens is alongside the, you know, the, the actual curriculum that you learn, you have all of this support that we give. Uh, didn't want to, you know, um, uh, talk about this very long, but if you'll have more questions about our programs, always happy to chat and, and, and you know, um, help you all more. Uh, but, you know, moving on to, to the COVID-19 scenario, which is where we find ourselves today. Uh, I feel that, you know, um, and, and I think Dashan already uh, started off with that conversation in, in his introductory note, that challenging times can also be opportunities for uh, innovation, right? And, and I completely subscribe to that. Uh, I think it's the time for young startups to think about innovative ideas uh, if you haven't already started. And if you already are on that journey, then, you know, the time for innovation and, and, and time for pivoting so that, you know, you can actually make use of the, of the challenge that we find ourselves in, but, you know, use that as an opportunity to, to, to uh, change your business model and innovate. Um, so, so, so how do I think about it, right? I mean, obviously there is this dwindling economic situation owing to the, the crisis and the pandemic we find ourselves in the middle of. I mean, all of us know enough about it, so not much to be said there. Um, so what, what has happened to people, right? Everybody just focused on the basics. Everybody's just thinking about the day-to-day -day stuff. Nobody's thinking of anything outlandish. I mean, you know, especially things like, you know, um, having a travel vacation or, or you know, um, going any anywhere far off. Um, everything is, you know, stuff that they can, they can enjoy, even if it's something to enjoy, even if it's entertainment, if it's available on their fingertips at home, right? So, so really then it's, it's about thinking about, okay, so what can we, what can we enable our consumers or our customers to have that they can find at the, you know, at their fingertips, but in the comfort of their home. Uh, and it's and it's because of that that you know things like you know apparel and textiles, aviation, construction, you know um, non-essential retail, transportation and logistics have really taken a backseat and a beating, right? Uh, and and if you were one of those startups that happened to be in one of these spaces or even an MSME, then you would have definitely taken a hit. Um, but there have been there have been others that have really benefited from it, and and uh, like I've mentioned here on the slide, healthcare, edtech, e-commerce are just some of those examples, right, that I've seen a dramatic boost. Uh, edtech is, is, is special to me because that's where I've spent a lot of my years. Uh, but, you know, you can see that there are certain sectors that have really uh, benefited and, and those that were able to quickly pivot, see the opportunity in this and, and move into that direction have, have really been able to uh, pull themselves up um, uh, towards a win, right? Um, but several startups have suddenly seen themselves finding themselves at a dead end, right? And, and, um, and that's sad. Um, you know, there are NASCOM studies that are talking about 70% startups having less, less than three months of, you know, cash left to burn. Um, and, and, you know, 40% are either going to shut down operations or on the verge of shutting down. And, you know, I, I actually think that startups is a very integral part of any economy, right? And, and thinking of India, thinking of, how we at the Vadwani Foundation are always thinking about jobs and creating employment, this is not a good story, right? Uh, you, you want startups to succeed. You want them to, to really uh, carry on the torch so that they can um, not only survive and sustain, but they can create jobs, they can create employment, things move on. Um, so, you know, um, it's, it's hard. I mean, obviously, uh, break-evens are no longer 
where they might have seemed a few months ago. So, you know, startups that were thinking about their financials in Jan or Feb might feel like, okay, it's gone completely out of whack because it's nowhere close to where it is uh, today. So, so I think that that presents an opportunity for some thought, um, presents an opportunity for innovation and presents an opportunity for thinking, well, there are two or three things I can do. I mean, I can either think of shutting down and, and you know, starting something else or getting back to the job market, which in itself doesn't seem very uh, exciting at this point. Um, or I can kind of think about where am I today and how can I innovate or pivot from here on and do something that can actually help me uh, further the cause and further my journey that I was already along. So then, you know, we're talking about thinking outside of the box, right? Um, I, I don't think that personally, if you ask me, shutting shops is not the solution. Um, and, and like I've said earlier, you know, where job cuts and pay cuts are already, you know, rampantly happening everywhere. Um, you know, I, 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 earlier today, I was at the airport, uh, gone to pick up my daughter who was returning from the US. And, um, you know, I met somebody from Indigo and they were saying, well, 3000 people were laid off in the coming month, they're laying off another 5000 people. You know, it just seems to be everywhere, right? Um, and therefore, you know, maybe trying to secure a well-paying job for job security might be wishful thinking at this point. It might not be the easiest thing. I, I don't mean to wear you guys down, but that may not be the app. So, so really, if then, you know, uh, you happen to already have a startup or a really interesting idea, uh, I think it's a good time if you're early in that journey to, you know, think about the constraints of the current situation and what we find ourselves in and then think about the opportunities that we can grab and that we can actually work on, right? Um, so, so what can, can potential entrepreneurs or existing entrepreneurs do? And I think that um, more now than ever, uh, pivot is the key word, right? I mean, how can you innovate and think outside of the box and actually take advantage of the unique situation? So one of them is, of course, identifying what are the new trends and what are the niche markets and emerging sectors, which we will talk about uh, you know, in the next slide. Uh, and that, of course, might be for people that, that are actually beginning on the journey, right? So, so you know that, okay, maybe I was thinking about retail, but you know, given what's happening, retail may not be the best option. Maybe I can think of um, you know, additive manufacturing, or maybe I can think of logistics, e-commerce, or whatever, right? So, so if you're early on that journey, you can still change your business idea, or you can change the problem that you want to solve for, or the solution that you want to come up with. Uh, but if you're already along that journey, even if it's you know a few months or a year or two into that journey, uh, it's a little harder, right? And 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 it requires a little bit of thought um, and a little bit of digging to really understand what is it that you can do uh, to ensure that um, you are able to look at your idea and ask yourself, okay, where can I go from here? What are the opportunities that uh, you know that uh, that lie in front of me, given the pandemic, that can actually make my current product work, or what can I do to pivot it such that it can work, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we, like I said, at Vadwani Foundation are shape-shifting, right, and bringing our entrepreneurship program uh, direct to students. Um, we want, I mean, and it's, of course, across Latin America, Southeast Asia, India, we are, we are doing it across emerging economies for high school students and early entrepreneurs. But our intention is to really support students, but also support early entrepreneurs who might find themselves wanting because of this. So that, that's an opportunity if you all would like us to support you in any way, we're here to support you and trying to identify your problem or try to identify how you can pivot the current problem you're solving for in your startup so that you know, we can help you to think outside of the box. Um, but really, these are, you know, the new opportunities and the way I see it uh, before I, you know, can take some questions and have a more interactive session. And um, definitely mental health guidance and counseling. I, I think it's all over the place. It's on every social media, uh, you know, handle that I go to uh, a lot of, you know, uh, mental health issues, uh, especially with the younger generation, finding themselves at home a lot. Uh, and, um, you know, therefore, maybe online counseling and guidance um, where people are experiencing, um, you know, tremendous bouts of, uh, you know, depression and anxiety. Uh, and, uh, you know, given the stigma around mental health uh, is eroding now and people actually beginning to accept that that's an issue that can be addressed and talked about. I think people are reaching out for help. And I think that's a great area. Uh, not something that in India even today is, is big, but I can definitely see it as emerging. 
um, in the future. Uh, and then, you know, blockchain, right? I mean, it's a technology that, uh, that uh, has already, uh, you know, uh, taken shape and, and has some roots uh, in India, but um, with the COVID situation and the world going pretty much digital and everybody's been working from home the past uh, four or five months, uh, this technology is now more in demand than ever before, right? Um, so that, you know, once you record information, it's impossible to change it and look back at it and, and cheat. So it kind of protects the privacy of people because you find so many people online and, and yet you can use the technology for, for various and, and multiple use cases, right? Um, then logistics and e-commerce, right? Again, you know, given that everybody wants to get everything to their doorstep at the comfort of their home, um, whether it's groceries, whether it's medicines, whether it's, um, um, I mean, anything that you want to buy um, is, is available at your doorstep. And so, um, you know, a, a, any, any startups that, um, that can think of unique and innovative ideas to get people to, to, you know, have services and products delivered to their doorstep. And I think that's a great intervention to think about as well. Um, and, and I don't think if even, you know, after a few months, once a vaccination is found and, you know, people do start going back to work, uh, I think everyone's enjoyed the experience to an extent, not of staying at home, but being able to get everything at home without really having to move around much, right? Um, and so, barring a few people that enjoy the experience of shopping in a retail context, um, I think this is here to stay, logistics and e-commerce. So I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon or people are going to change those habits. Um, another one, and again, my pet topic, like I mentioned before, is health, education, and finance. So health tech, ed tech, and fintech have really, um, again, you know, um, seen, seen absolutely uh, crazy valuations, and I've also seen uh, crazy amounts of uh, uh, users coming online, um, right from preschool to K-12 to, you know, higher ed. Um, students have been online the past several months. Uh, parents, of course, have been complaining that they have to spend a lot of time uh, with kids, especially the younger kids. Uh, but um, in spite of that, they've seen um, huge jumps in, in you know, their customers and, and consumers. Um, so also for health tech, um, I mean, just given the fact that uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, obviously, um, well-being and, and, and good health is, is becoming even more important to people and, and people believe that if they can, you know, get, get treatment or get advice sitting at home, they prefer it to be that way as opposed to going to a hospital or visiting a doctor. So I think that, um, that, that again, health tech has really taken off. And uh, FinTech uh, had a bit of a, you know, um, a downtime a few months ago, uh, but I think it's back and up again uh, because, you know, just to enable digital payments of all of these, you know, logistic and e-commerce companies that we were talking about, I think FinTech needs to have, uh, you know, uh, a presence in a way that, that can enable all of this e-commerce to happen, right? Um, and then additive manufacturing, um, you know, which is pretty much 3D printing, but anything from manufacturing PPE that a lot of young people have uh, taken to doing as an opportunity out of this pandemic, uh, but other things like face shields, valves, or respiratory machines, whatever the case might be, uh, but, uh, but all of these are, are things that, um, have led to new age manufacturing, which nobody would have thought of uh, maybe six, eight months ago, have, have now emerged as new fields that people believe are not only going to be required in the pandemic, but these are going to be continued to, uh, to be needed around the world and globally. So, so these are some ideas and new opportunities that I feel um, young students that are you know, looking to get into uh, the entrepreneurial journey can look forward to. I think um, that uh, these 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 opportunities are are just a few that I've mentioned. There are more out there, uh, but uh, you know if you think about the problem in the right way, and you think about how you want to solve for a pain point for a customer, some of these uh, these ideas can really lead to to some awesome businesses. And and I um, I feel that um, this is a good time uh, to be thinking about any of these for anyone that's beginning to think about how to how to brainstorm a new business idea. So I'm going to stop there. Um, you know, it's, it's half past five and I'd like to leave half an hour to, to interact and ask uh, and have you guys ask me questions and let me answer them for you. Um, so I will uh, hand it back to the Flame team and see if there are any questions out there that um, 
that some of our participants want to ask. So thank uh, you. Thanks a lot, Monica. Uh, you know, I think that was fantastic uh, on, on both the fronts, you know, the kind of uh, breadth of activities at Wadwani Foundation, you know, uh, we discussed, uh, I was part as an advisor to support on the startup scale up program of Wadwani Foundation back in 2018 and 19. And uh, just the breadth of activities of Wadwani Foundation are just, uh, you know, mind blowing. And the kind of approach uh, that is taken is fluid uh, and, and looking at what needs to be solved, right, at that point. So we do have some questions very specifically about the programs. But before we do that, I had a couple of questions for you, uh, just in continuing on uh, crisis uh, uh, problems which are also opportunities right you 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 mentioned a lot about you know the five different uh, areas which mm -hmm. are but most the underlying theme over there seems to be technology mm -hmm. right so technology which will help enable and uh, and uh, provide continuity to business to a certain extent Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, just wanted to learn a little bit more uh, from you because we have a large number of startups which are which uh, are tech focused. We have about 10, 11,000 startups in India which are tech focused. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, the backbone of Indian economy is medium, small scale businesses, which may or may not be tech enabled or even have digital transformation. So my first question to you is what will it take? for some of the existing startups or family businesses to repurpose and reimagine and be tech, tech enabled, right? So just a thought uh, based on your experience, how someone can approach that problem. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Darshan. So, um, uh, you know, I didn't speak more about uh, Badwani Foundation outside of the NEN program, right? Because I just wanted to keep it short. But since I'm addressing this, uh, we do have a program that's called Badwani Advantage. And uh, through this program, we consult and support a lot of MSMEs in India and, and in Mexico. Uh, in fact, we've just launched the Sahaita program, which is where, you know, our founder has uh, committed several crores uh, to support MSMEs. And during this work that we've done, while I'm not the one that leads the program, um, it is evident that, you know, a lot of traditional family businesses that fall under this whole MSME, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, bucket, um, oftentimes for them, technology can probably just mean a website, right? I mean, you know, some of them don't even have that. So when we, when we are talking to them about, you know, going digital, for them, digital probably in many cases just means having a website. So we actually, you know, support them with creating a digital strategy. I mean, this is not something that comes easy to them. Uh, probably these are businesses that have been handed down and therefore they haven't started mobile first or they haven't started digital first. Uh, and, and whenever you have, whether it's a manufacturing business or a retail business that uh, has not started digital first, it's, it, it's much harder. It, it takes that much more of an effort for that to happen. But what we have seen is because of the COVID-19 um, you know, uh, pandemic that hit us and whether they were in manufacturing or whether they were in retail or whatever businesses they might have been in, could have been restaurant chains or whatever, they realized that going online, get, you know, having a digital presence is critically important. And um, um, uh, whether it was hiring people for digital marketing uh, you know, or, and, and social media or whether it was taking help from us in a consulting model to, to actually create a digital strategy for themselves, we can see that they're really trying to change the way they think about things. Coming to young startups, um, we see two kinds of startups, at least in the cohorts that we have, and I would love to see what your thoughts are because you have several cohorts too. We have some, especially from tier one and two cities that start digitally, right? So these, uh, these startups are already um, thinking of mobile first or, or it's, it's a tech enabled business. I mean, uh, there is no business if it's not tech enabled. Uh, but we do see in tier two and three cities uh, in the smaller towns and, and in the B and C tier colleges that we are with, where students are wanting to solve for local community problems, right? Not everybody wants to be a tech enabled uh, business that is solving for all of India's problems. It could be a local community problem. And to that extent, they're not tech enabled. Uh, but we support both. And I think there is, a, there is a case and a space for both today, right? Not only the tech enabled ones, which definitely can scale, uh, but, but uh, local community problems that can be solved where 
technology may be a small component uh, and a small enabler, but but largely the, the business is offline. So hopefully I've answered your question, but, but those are my thoughts. Perfect, perfect. Just to build on those, you know, uh, at the Flame Origins program, we are sector agnostic as well. So we've had, uh, in fact, what we've done in our selection process is tried to bring similar stage startups from across sectors and different value propositions because the cross learning and the cross network that they're able to build um, uh, creates magic, right? And, and we've seen that happen in some of our cohorts. Uh, just going back to the SME, uh, we actually, uh, you know, when I was involved with Vadwani Foundation, Anubhav uh, Gera was heading the SME uh, yes. vertical and we tied up with the Maharashtra Chamber of Commerce to run an accelerator program which was about five months long uh, focused to the auto industry, auto components because Pune uh, has a huge auto industry presence. Uh, manufacturing hub, right? So that program actually took off really well. And uh, we have a couple of um, uh, the attendees who were part of that program joining us today as well. So uh, we had good testimonials come through from them uh, as well. But I think uh, digital transformation is, is, is a big, big component. We had uh, Dr. Ganesh Natarajan, um, you know, the ex-CEO of Zensar and uh, chairman of uh, 5F World, which is a skilling organization today, uh, speak a little bit about digital transformation and what could be done, how it could be done, uh, right? So those recordings are available for anyone else who would like to see. Uh, we do have some questions. I'm going to pick up some questions before I have some more questions of my own. Um, uh, here's Rupesh Kashyap. I'm a founder uh, and working on a SaaS project with product uh, with whose prototype is ready. I wanted to understand how the Vadwani Foundation program can help us in fundraising. A lot of the startups today are, are, are stressed on cash, right? Either uh, from a runway point of view and everyone is looking to, to fundraise based on my experience. Maybe I'll broaden this question a little bit and, and hear your thoughts on A, how does Vadwani Foundation help on fundraising? Two, how should startups look at fundraising today? Yeah. So these are great questions. Um, I'm going to first talk about Vadvani Foundation and then kind of broaden the, the answer. So at Vadvani Foundation, our intention is to um, handhold our startups. We're not a funding agency because we're a non-for-profit. So we don't make direct equity investments as a foundation. Uh, having said that, we do have our own uh, partnerships with various VCs, with various incubators. Um, all sorts of people in the ecosystem where once students that have been through our programs and we normally have all, on a yearly basis, we have almost 4,000 um, startups coming out of our programs, right? So we do want to ensure that some of the best of those do get showcased across, um, you know, some startup competitions or, or ecosystem partners or VCs, etc. So we have our own partnerships that we normally help our students with. Um, on another note, we have another program, which I haven't talked about, but since it will answer your question, outside of the NEN program, we have something called the Venture Fast Track program. And the Venture Fast Track program is for early stage businesses, which have maybe a minimum viable product and some early revenues. Uh, we have just received a grant from uh, Gates Foundation about six months ago. And we literally last week launched with the Atal Innovation Mission, uh, a training program for 100 Atal Innovation Mission incubators and uh, for their incubators. So we are helping them uh, onboard cohorts and all of these are funded incubators from other innovation missions. So therefore in, in turn, they fund their incubators. So I would recommend, um, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the person that asked the question. I think it was Rupesh uh, that, that, you know, I, I think you should probably, if you'd like, you should talk to one of the Atal Innovation Mission Incubators because they're looking for good ones. Some of them are focused on deep tech. So you should talk to one of them to see if, you know, you, um, you the profile of your startup is matches the kind of cohorts they're looking to onboard because automatically when you're a part of their incubating cohort, uh, you get funded by default, right? So I think that's, that's uh, one suggestion. And yes, if you, if you do go through one of our programs, which are actually free, um, you, you would then, if you, if you bubbled up on top of the, the top 15 or 20%, we support you too. But we're not a funding agency ourselves. Um, but now getting to the broader question of, so how can startups think about funding, right? Um, 
So I have two or three different answers. Um, my first recommendation is um, try, try and bootstrap and you know, try and see how you can minimize cash burn and, and really extend the runway that, that one can uh, to the extent that's possible. Uh, the second, there are a lot of uh, VCs that have um, taken note of the fact that there would be some interesting opportunities coming out of the pandemic. Because again, right, like Dashana rightly pointed out, WhatsApp and a lot of others, uh, you know, came out of came out of you know challenging times. And so they know that some interesting and and meaningful uh, startups will come out of this. So they they do have, for example, Waterbridge um, Ventures had uh, some. Um, I mean, they reached out to me, I think about two or three months ago, and they had uh, a $25 million fund that they had put together just for startups coming out of the pandemic. Uh, I know Omidya Network, my, my um, ex-company, uh, has put together a fund where they're uh, supporting certain startups. Of course, they've got certain areas and, and certain um, you know, st strategies around which areas they want to invest in. But I know for a fact that uh, there are a lot of um, VCs that have put together funds specially to, to address the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, for those that have had initial investments from angel investors or, you know, seed capital from family and friends, I would say, you know, think of an, uh, think of an additional round, right? Um, because uh, it might be harder to convince VCs at this point uh, unless you've shown some traction in business. So, so those would be my top two or three ideas. Um, for, for a more, as, as a more broad-based answer of what you can do. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Monica. We have a question from Mohit Agarwal. Um, does the foundation have any program to support professionals who want to become entrepreneurs? So, um, so absolutely, Mohit. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you were there through the program, but we do have the foundation and the advanced course, and depending on where you are in your journey, um, one of these programs will, will be the right one for you. And we do take lateral entries, which means we are in 125 colleges in India, uh, amongst some, some of them amongst us are IITs and IIMs, but we are also in a lot of B and C tier colleges. So if we don't happen to be in your college, and if you're not already in college or you graduated already, then, uh, then we take lateral entries. So you can actually come in directly uh, into our program and, and be a part of that cohort. Excellent. And then, um, uh, Mohit, uh, you know, we, uh, the one year program that we've put together, a postgraduate program in entrepreneurship, is for people who are looking to build businesses, right? So it goes through from effectuation, which is should I be building a startup? Why should I be building a startup? Do, am I in the financial state to launch a business? Do I have the mindset? Uh, am I, is there a founder market fit uh, for what I want to do, right? So uh, definitely take a look at both the programs. Uh, I vouch for both of them. Uh, and that's why we are partners, right? So definitely take a look at it. I've shared uh, the links in the chat box. So you, you should be able to access both NEM and the PGPEI. Now, uh, here's a question uh, from Devdatta Puntambekar. He was part of our uh, accelerator program at Flame Origins program, an augmented reality startup. In EdTech, we are talking about K-12 and higher education. How do you see medical education changing in the new normal, especially comprehension and hands-on skills training for medical students? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. So while, while I, I can't claim to have expertise on this, um, what I can say is that um, it's a niche, right? And, and when you think about the 300 million children that you have in India, the, the number of people that would want to go through medical training would be a smaller number. So um, I definitely think there is a case for online training for medical professionals. And I have seen companies in the past, uh, some of them from India, and I had also seen in my past Avtara, a company from Israel, that had um, uh, 3D, um, you know, 3D simulations for for how a surgery can be done, for example, right? Because when you when you study medicine, I mean, uh, it, it, it's a lot of what you need to do as well and learn learn physically. So so there were a lot of 3D simulations, and now with AR and VR, I'm sure all of that is possible. So I definitely think there is a case for creating um, uh, training for medical professional curriculum. 
Um, I, I would want to though think about scale and, and I don't know how scalable that is because at the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm not sure of the numbers, but I would assume that we probably have somewhere between 100 to 150,000 people graduating on a yearly basis from, from the medical stream, which is not a large number to cater to. So um, I would probably supplement that with, with, with other courses. Um, would be my, would be my Excellent. Thank you, Monica. Here's a question from Ayush Biyani. Mm -hmm. uh, many businesses have had to resort to unsustainable means during the crisis to resume operations. For example, single use plastic um, and whatnot. How does one manage such paradoxes and risk of a trend reversal when planning a new business? Uh, if I can rephrase that, a lot of uh, existing businesses may have gotten into making sanitizers or um, uh, masks or even cut down on costs. Uh, uh, but with the behavior change during COVID crisis, post crisis, will that business still succeed? I think that is the question. Um. I don't think there's a single answer to that. Um, if it is things like face masks and hand sanitizers, um, I, I, I don't imagine that they will go away, but I don't think that the kind of um, consumer need will be at the level at where it is today, if you think about two years out from now. Um, but if you ask me, will edtech and health tech remain at the levels they are? I would say probably yes, because this is just something that, uh, you know, once you have accepted this as a way of learning. Just for example, um, at Padwani Foundation, uh, I'm based out of Mumbai and we have an office in Andheri. And uh, I mean, and, and it's a lovely office, but the, the decision has been made at the highest level that we will never go back to working from office. It's going to be a permanent work from home solution with the office just being a space where you will have certain rooms that you will go and actually, um, actually book to, to, to to have meetings, I mean, you know, where you need to have group meetings and, and which are required for progress at work. Um, similarly, I have talked to a lot of educators and especially because edtech is, is something that I'm close to. And I know that they, they even when schools start full-fledgedly in, in whatever time frame, they never intend to go back to complete only classroom teaching and learning, right? So some of these habits are going to get embedded in people. Uh, I know for a fact that I can now um, go on a Zoom call with my dermatologist and, um, you know, finish something in 15 minutes. And I mean, I have sat outside doctor's clinics for sometimes 45 minutes, just waiting to get my turn. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost always running late and spending some time and then going and coming back. And so to me, something that used to take me an hour and a half or two can now be done online over a Zoom call um, at the same or at a lower cost. And, and I'm totally happy with that, right? So, I mean, I'm just giving examples of health tech and ed tech, and I don't think that these habits are going to go away. So for some businesses, I think this is, this has come as a boon. And I think it'll, these habits have been now cultivated and they're here to stay is my, my sense. And then there are some that are really pandemic specific, like, like sanitizers and face masks, et cetera. So definitely it's, it's put us on a good stead in terms of good hygiene habits, but I don't think the usage is going to be at the level that it is today. Excellent. You know, that was, that was fantastic. Uh, here's a question from uh, Rujuta Jaktab. She was part of the Vadwani Foundation SME program that we conducted here uh, along with MCCI in Pune. So I'm not sure whether this falls under your domain, but putting out the question in any case. I have done the debut program of the Vadwani Foundation program with uh, MCCI. Is there a platform where we can connect with the domain experts, Pan India, who are the faculties in your program? as well as with fellow entrepreneurs who have undergone this in different locations to learn from each other. Yes. So um, the Vadmani Found, uh, Foundation Advantage Program is launching a new platform called Genie. It should be out soon. And uh, it'll probably do a lot of the things that you're asking. It, it'll give you access to other entrepreneurs so that there can be a community of entrepreneurs that can exchange ideas, thoughts, solutions. Uh, and on the other side, that there will be experts and mentors, either industry experts or domain, uh, do, sorry, industry and domain experts and functional experts 
that will enable you to connect with them either for mentoring or advice or you know some kind of um, interaction um, it's not yet launched but it should be out soon great uh, here's a question from uh, dheeraj uh, who's part of the one year postgraduate program in entrepreneurship and innovation i already have an idea how can i detect the problems i might face by implementing the idea should i take the risk of directly launching my product in the market and then face it and resolve it or should i work on paper where i might miss some crucial step which might impact the startup future uh, i have an idea i have some thoughts but would love to hear your thoughts on how dheeraj should proceed so to me an idea is not enough unless you know you're solving for a pain point right so because you've written idea um i'm not sure if you also thought through the pain point and and i'll i'll help you understand what i'm saying so to me if you have an idea but you don't know how the consumer would will, will react to it and you've not done some amount of surveys or some amount of you know understanding your consumer because some things can be a nice to have and some things can be a need to have right so for example when uber decided to go out into the market it had framed its its uh, solution very well right and because the idea is actually a solution for a pain point so it said three things it said you will never need to own a wallet you will never need to own a car and you will never need to have directions to where you want to go now if uber is solving all of those three pain points for you then you are the right consumer for them so i would definitely do some amount of market survey for the for the solution that you have for the pain point that you're trying to address but i think that at an early stage you need to keep pivoting based on what is coming back as feedback from the market so after some initial surveys and some initial you know talking to potential customers i would um i would make something quick and dirty test it out in the market and then bring it back so that i can kind of you know rework on it or pivot some of those um features aspects of the service or product or whatever it is um you know and keep refining it i've i've met a lot of tech entrepreneurs who so fall in love with that product that they spend years trying to build out the perfect product and then they've never really thought about the product market fit or the go to market strategy and then you know here they've they've spent a lot of money trying to create the best product and realize that there isn't a product market fit so i would kind of build something quick and dirty test it out and and bring it back to to further innovate that's what i would do excellent if i can just build on that uh, you know uh, lean startup by eric ries is an iterative methodology where you make a quick minimum viable product meaning it has to be viable to be used by the customer and then ash moria uh, has taken this one step further and said make your prototype and get your customers to pay for it as soon as possible because only when they pay for it there is some use and you will see whether you have built something that people want or is actually solving a problem right the other side of it is there is a book called as uh, an entrepreneur's guide to customer development it's about a 100 page uh, book which is a shorter version of the uh, four steps to uh, epiphany by steve blank and it captures very beautifully how you can do product development and customer development in an iterative loop right so getting a quick uh, and dirty product out which meets the solves the one problem for which the customer is willing to use and to pay and then put that in loop and then build from there i think that's one way uh, of looking at it um and then you know you can look up lean startup and uh, the customer and entrepreneur's guide to customer development online for the book as well uh great so we are about 5 minutes away the last question um for you is from prem kumar uh this is got to do with financing and funding and runways what according to you should be the ideal runway for a startup where they are able to sustain themselves without significant revenue coming in in a crisis situation such as the one today versus raising funding right so how much time how much runway should 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 they look to build yeah so i mean this we find ourselves in an unusual situation right and i and i i mean this is not a great measure of what um, regularly my answer would have been uh, but 
if, if it was not for the pandemic, I would have said 12 to 18 months. I just have seen a lot of founders spending almost all of their time only trying to fundraise. And so every time you fundraise and you raise a small amount, then you've got six, way, six months of runway. And then again, you're back in the market trying to raise more money. So I think if you really want to be focused on the task at hand, which is actually building out your business and acquiring customers, then if you had about 12 to 18 months of cash, it gives you enough time to, you know, think about your product, uh, take it to market, get feedback, build out a more robust product, and then go for a, you know, a, the next series of, of funding. So I would say 12 to 18. Excellent. Uh, here's a question from Tarun Kohli. Uh, what, according to you, are the key reasons why many startups might fail in the first two years? Um, any loopholes and ways to overcome such shortcomings? Yeah, there are so many, but I think I'm, I'm going to go with three that for me are the top most, right? Um, I'm going to give you an investor's perspective because I've been an investor for nine years. The first one is always the team. Um, I have learned both through my successes and failures that teams can make or break a company, a startup, an idea. Um, I normally think that it's nice if one, two or three of the co-founders between them have, um, have the, the abilities of a hacker, a hustler and a visionary. Very often these days businesses are tech enabled so a hacker is important. Uh, or a hustler because you know, you've got to keep changing, pivoting, innovating. Uh, and then, uh, of course, a visionary, someone who's more strategic in their thought process and is, you know, you know thinking about the, the company um, one to two years out at any given point in time. So I think the composition of the team is really important because that's what's going to help the business to sustain itself. And even if things went wrong, I've seen really good quality teams being able to quickly pivot and, and um, take the business to a different direction and successfully so. And some of the best ideas have failed because the teams have not been great team. So team is the, is the number one. Uh, the number two that I would say is, um, you know, um, oftentimes excessive funding. Um, I, 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 I see value in bootstrapping. I see value in being lean in terms of how much money it takes you to get to your first hundred or first 500 customers. Um, companies who get funded very early on and with a lot of money uh, seem to blow it up a lot in either, you know, product innovation or in, you know, digital marketing or, or whatever the customer acquisition, uh, then your CAC is out of whack, your, you know, and if your lifetime value is not very long, depending on what kind of business you're in, uh, your unit economics suffer, and then you just become not a very exciting prospect for any investor. So I would say I, I like to see companies and, and promoters that have bootstrapped themselves, right, um, to a large extent. And uh, I would say the third, uh, the third most important thing for me um, to ensure startup success would be, uh, like I said before, really thinking about your idea or your product or service. Is it really solving for a problem that a customer has that's, that's a need to have? Because there's a very fine line between a nice to have and a need to have product. And for me, scale is everything. So if you if you don't have a product that can scale, which means a lot of people need to have this product, then chances are that, you know, you're not going to hit economies of scale. So, so to me, those are the three top things amongst many others. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Monica. We're at 559. Uh, so I think we're going to uh, draw a close over here. Uh, thanks a lot. Just a quick uh, announcement for everyone over here. Our next session is on Saturday. Uh, the 8th of August. Um, you know, the media talks a lot about success stories. We are used to hearing all the great stories of great entrepreneurs who built multi-billion dollar businesses. But very few people are willing to talk about their failures, their entrepreneurial journeys. And so on Saturday, what we've got is uh, a dear friend, uh, Vandana Saxena Poria, who's the chief alarmist at the Human Alarm Clock, and she's an advisor to ICAEW India. So she's going to talk about her journey from failures to freedom um, and the lessons that she's learned uh, in her entrepreneurial journey. So that should be a, an, a very candid, a very vibrant discussion. Uh, I encourage all of you to, to, to join us on Saturday. Uh, coming back, uh, Monica, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, your insights have been 
phenomenal. Uh, the questions keep coming in. Um, but for everyone, uh, we will share the recording of this uh, video uh, with you by tomorrow morning. Um, and anyone who would like to access the previous sessions, you will find it on the Flame University YouTube channel. Again, have a great uh, evening, everyone. Stay safe uh, and stay healthy. And thank you, Monica. Looking thank forward you. to working with you. Pleasure being here. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care.